I've been, I myself as the lawyer have walked in the court and been told to wait for your attorney to check you in. What? In a suit in and a tie. Su- I, I went off. Yeah, man. but do you love it when you get to say, I am the lawyer? Well, I was more ignorant than that. I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, bro, I got $500 shoes on and a $1,000 briefcase. Who the fuck you think you're talking to? Yes. Like, I learned a lot about my friends becoming a lawyer. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, bro. Beating the shit out of their wives. And then you got to sit there and play Defend that them. in the cut podcast. We got homie Ruben Orchata. Um, I just called you that on purpose because I know you gave it up. I don't know why, but Ruben Ramirez, I guess if you want to go with, uh, with uh, uh, my, my government, your yeah. government, which is cool. I, yeah. I understood the branding deal. You wanted to brand yourself, which was smart, but then you took that away and then you went government. So yeah. to me, it was like I went <laughs> Lowe's cut it for so long. I'm, I still rep it, but I also rep Carlos Estrella. Carlos Estrella is such a fire name. Like, Thank you, bro. It's like, just, <laughs> you know what Estrella to, means? Shout out to your parents, brother. Yeah. You know what Estrella means, right, Vinny? Uh-huh. You know what Estrella means? Uh-huh. Star. Uh, so Estrella Carlos is, is a star. Estrella is star in Spanish. Nice. So every time people hear my last name, they'll be like, damn, that's a nice uh, last name. Oh, Vinny. It's, it's very rare. Hey, his name's Vinny? Bro, no, Mini. Mini. So we'll go by Mo on this. Mo, Mo. Right, Mo. Big, big Mo. Okay. You don't do. You does anyone call you Mini? Bro, I, it's funny you say that because <laughs> I'll have my. Fr- so the rule in the office is if they call the office and say Mini, that means they really know me, right? Right. And the first time it ever happened, they called and my paralegal. I walked in the office. She's like, "Who's Mini?" I'm like, "Wait, what?" She's like, "Some <laughs> guy called and said I'm looking for Mini. He'll know who I am." I'm like, oh. "I looked at the name." Was one of the guys, so yeah, now they know, but in the, in the beginning, they were so confused like, who the fuck yeah. is that? Did you hire somebody we didn't know? I'm like, no, just know if they call me that, that means they it's really so weird, know too. Me. Yeah, because <laughs> so, yeah, guys, if you guys are just watching, this is my guy, uh, Mo, he's a lawyer. We're gonna get into all that, all the benefits, and why it's important to have a lawyer on your side or a lawyer, a lawyer in general. So, with that being said, um, I did call you, Minnie Ruben, you just, you just met Mo, yep. We grew up, I, I've known you, bro, for almost 20 years, give or take. When I, when I started at Official Cuts and yeah. when I was like a teenager. Even before Official Cuts, I remember you were at, uh, 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 I had her one of yeah, Oh, damn, <laughs> damn. We go way back like yeah, that. I remember that. So the three XYTs, bro. We go back to that. <laughs> we, go, we go way back. <laughs> YTs, so baby. we went to, man, you switching crazy, Ricky. <laughs> What do you mean we haven't started? <laughs> you been, said press record. You said you've been recording. <laughs> oh my god! All right. Headquarters. This guy's going. I'm just seeing it in my peripheral. <laughs> and I was like, "What the fuck's going on here?" <laughs> That's a clip. <laughs> <laughs> That's a clip. It was a nice setup, though. That's we nice um setup. we used to do it over there in the table, which was dope. But I just wanted more of a set, man. I wanted. Nah, to this feel- is nice. Couch in the background, I like that. Yeah, I had a rep. We're finally in Chicago. I, I used to be in Oklahoma repping that shit. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm in Chicago. I was you can like, do it. <laughs> now it, it feels official. Two minutes from the United Center, it feels right. I want to introduce you guys, my guy Mo, my longtime friend, yes, also a lawyer that I'm proud to say I never had a call. And I got a few of those on standby that I thank God that I never have to call, but I do refer people when you called ask. me for positive stuff, though. I did. What have yeah. I called you for? Uh, some of your earlier contract work. Oh, right. So, so you also, so you guys don't know, he also um, was a part of the first level three contract that we yeah. did. So I don't think they were level three yet. Was it the other brand yeah. before? Damn. Okay. And then we did the level three um, and all that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we did it from way back then. And, and I know, you know, I call him many. We were just talking about that before Ricky said we weren't, we were, we weren't recording. So now that we're recording. <laughs> Called them mini for so long that it's so hard to st- get out of that because you said it yourself, right? If someone calls you mini, it's because they truly know you. But people in your law firm and your office are like, "What's going on with that?" Yeah, they didn't know, and I had to. I, I was telling you the first time I walked in the office and someone called and they're asking for mini, and my paralegal was <laughs> like, "Hey man, who the hell did you hire someone new?" I'm like, "No way." They're like, "They're asking for this random person." I said, "Look." If anybody calls and calls me that, that means they really know me. They really know you. I don't know why they're calling the office because they probably have my cell number. But yeah, if anyone calls me that, just send the call directly to me. That you know, you know, know what's me. crazy? It's funny though because with me, it's the complete opposite. Everyone calls me Lowe's. If someone calls and says, "Is Carlos there?" <laughs> Then I'm like, yo, <laughs> who is that? Is that my mom? <laughs> that person got to know me because no one calls me Carlos. And Ruben, for you, it's just Ruben, right? No one really calls you. I mean, Ruben, Rube, whatever. Ruben, all, yeah. all the above. Yeah, I mean, yeah, nothing specific. It's not like 
Oh, this dude. Oh, he he called me by Big R. He know that I kiss him. <laughs> nah, it ain't nothing like that. That's man. dope. <laughs> hey, like, I gotta ask you, Ruben. Do you wonder why they call him Mini? Mini? He probably had a. Uh, I don't know, a baby Glock on him, and they know him. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, like, oh, he got the minigun out. So, so. <laughs> no, the true story is, um, so I'm the youngest of three brothers. Uh, my oldest brother, um, when in his younger days, um, they called him Monster for nice. reasons you could read between the lines. Yeah. So then, it, you know, my other brother came. So it was very easy at the time. It, you were little, whatever your older brother was, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Then the third generation came, and we just completely fucked everything up because people <laughs> had no idea what to say, right? Dude, he's called Baby one, he, Mini. Yeah. <laughs> I heard uh, Itty Bitty Monster. I heard <laughs> Baby Monster. <laughs> Itty Bitty So monster. I used to be really good at basketball, and one day I was just uh, playing ball, and one of the older guys was like, man, we need to come up with a name for you. I'm like, bro, I don't care. Call me whatever the hell you want. So he came up with Mini Monster. I'm like, you know what? That sound that has a nice Monster. ring to it. So it's stuck, and then people just got lazy, and they just left it at Mini, and that how it That's came dope, about. man. Who who was Monster? Uh, Ram or Monty? No, Monty. He Monty. was the oldest. He's the oldest. Yeah, he was the oldest. So all, the, uh, all three of you guys successful, you know, like to to another level. But then again, it's it's in your culture, man. You it's the work ethic. Yeah, you, you guys know. are all monsters, and that, that's how I met. Um, that's how I met you, Yak. Working with Yak Shop too, like. We, you guys just, he knew all the big brothers. And then when you were coming around, you were. Yak used to, I was one of first, uh, Yak's first customers. Uh, he used to come in his mom's flower shop. I Damn. did have hair at one point. I promise you. He I did. did at some point. Had my, I had nice. a hair. And yeah, I used, he used to come in his mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he used to come in his mom's flower shop. Um, and that was when I had a head of hair. So yeah, I go way back. Oh, way, way back. Way there. back. Yeah. I used to, 12 o'clock at night, you know, he would do his day job and all his other hustles. You know, Yak's been hustling since he was like two years old. So, <laughs> yeah. Yak's, yeah, he's been, he's always at a hustle, and it would just be like, man, I get you in at midnight. I'm like, man, fuck it. That that cut was fire. Damn. And I remember people like, where did you go? They would think I'm lying to him. Like, bro, my guy cut me in his mom's flower shop. Man, why are you holding up, bro? Where's the <laughs> barber shop? I'm like, bro, he really don't have a barber shop. Like, I'm not Damn. lying to you. He really doesn't. And he finally opened up official cuts, and I'm like, all right, go here, guys. Mm. Get yeah, that's literally, man, it's crazy. Because I, I, remember, I remember he tells that story all the time, like the flower shop. And I can't picture it. Just at a milk crate, he would say sometimes. Yep, we sat on a milk crate or like a big box that had shit in it that we didn't <laughs> fall through. And he would just, just put in the work. And probably some of the best, I bet you he probably gave the best cuts he ever had was in that flower shop. Oh. Just That was his prime days. Um, yeah, so I go way back with the act till then. That's dope. Yeah, so I've known, like I said, I've known this guy for so long, man. Almost 20 years, if not 20 years. Um, so I ain't gonna lie, when you, when I found out you're going to law school and you became a lawyer, it, it, it was almost like shocking to me because mm-hmm. it, it made me realize like, damn, somebody who's one of us, you know, who's from the streets, who grew up in the streets and all that, just literally went right mm-hmm. where everybody else was more in like, Hey, let's get a uh, clothing store. Right. Let's do the hustle. Let's get gas station and shop. Let's do the, the, you know, like the hustle mentality. Mm-hmm. You went the other route. And I remember I went to your... Um, I'm not sure what it was like a graduation party. Yeah, we went there and we ate. We celebrated you, and it was dope because it was just cool seeing like damn somebody made it. Mm-hmm. Like finally, you know what That's I mean. That's part of why I went to law school. You know, I, I started off community college. Um, I was just messing around. Um, I I started. I actually pulled my transcript from Moraine Valley. I had a 1.8 GPA at one point when I started there. Damn. But I got to a point, where, like you said, I said, you know, I, I did the store stuff and I did all that. I, I said, I know I don't want to do that forever. And I said, I, I, I kind of wanted to break that chain within all of our communities. You know, none of us grew up around lawyers and all that. And I said, you know, someone at some point has to break this this kind of mold and show an example for people that grew up like yeah. us, and especially first generation. Our parents are immigrants. And, yeah. you know, um, everything they gave up, I wanted to make sure that it, it, the sacrifice was worth it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I just knew I said not only do I want to break the chain, but if I can be that voice for my guys and people that look like me and grew up like me to be able to be comfortable enough to come to me. And now, you know, I've been practicing 12 years now and I still love the fact that my guys can call, know that they got somebody that can speak like them, that can understand them. And that means more to me than any check in the world. Cause it was, you know, the street guys are the ones that kept me in line, believe it or not. It wasn't like, you know, I had all these lawyers around. I didn't have any of that. It was the street dudes that said, yo, don't fuck up like us. Be our voice. Go be right. the change and, and be for us. So, yeah, that played a big role in, in kind of my decision. And, you know, um, barely made it to law school. I got denied by every law school except one. Wow. Had a conditional acceptance. Um, I went there. I finished bottom 20 in my class. 
Um, and then November 14th, 2011, I got sworn in. December 1st, I opened up my own law practice. 2011? That's when it was? 2011. Damn, why do I still line? remember it? <laughs> yeah. Like, it was like 2016. Yeah. Damn. So, he brought up a great point, man. He, he's pretty much said he wanted to break that chain, you know, and, and be the lawyer for people like us. Because I have two lawyer's numbers. One of them is my longtime client, and then you. And I never use you guys. And I thank God every day that I don't, because especially for bad stuff. But what I do is I've always referred. I've always gave contact information, whether they reached out or not. But one of the things that you just said, and I really want to get down to the bottom of this, because we were just talking about that. Being a lawyer, especially being able to have your friends or your people contact you and feel safe with you, how has that been? What have you discovered about the people's closest to you? You know, and I know you can't men don't mention names. No, obviously. I won't. I, I don't <laughs> have to mention names. stories, man. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. I, I've had dudes that, yo, bro, remember we were in third period gym together? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I see that message, all right, bro, what do you want? You know, like I know what's coming. And I tell people, those kind of people do they annoy me a little bit, but like my guys, guys, which is funny, my the guys that I will do work for and not charge always want to pay me. And it's out of respect and it's out of courtesy. And the people that I don't really know you like that and mm -hmm. you got to respect my time and pay for it, always want the discount, always want the free yeah, advice. And, and I have to remind them, you know, uh, our knowledge is our craft, right? It, just because I, I can give you this information, don't take advantage of it, um, knowing, oh, that's my guy. He's going to spend an hour with me. Well, bro, I charge... 400 an hour, <laughs> you know what yes, I mean? Sir. Like, So respect my hustle, and, and, and my close friends have respected my hustle, but, oh, I've been burned by friends, or, you know, friends, I mean, just literally not even pay my tab, stop answering. Wow. Um, I get asked for all types of favors, um, you know, but I've seen the bad side. Like, uh, I was telling them a story earlier. I've seen one of my friends snitch on my other friends <laughs> oh my and God. i can't say anything because attorney client privilege is just like oh shit and you know i've seen guys that i thought were good dudes and then they call me and they got you know domestic violence it's <laughs> like damn bro i thought you were a calm ass dude and come to find out you're kind of an asshole <laughs> um, so you you know what you learn a lot about people when they're in distress and that's one thing I learned that when someone's in distress or they're going through something, because we never get calls for anything good. I mean, it's very rare. Right. I need you to yeah, contract. I need you to outside of a contract or you're starting a new business. Outside of that, bro, you don't call us for anything positive, right? I mean, like right now we do mostly auto accidents. That's not a fun thing to do. When we did criminal defense, that was another tripped out thing. Like when my friends are calling me at night, it's like, are they locked up or they want to hang out? <laughs> <laughs> I would never know. Are they calling me because somebody's got locked up or they, they want to go hang out? So uh, you get a mixed bag, but you do start to see who really fucks with you and who's just there for whatever it is that they need. For the, the yeah, for, for the convenience too. Mm -hmm. But same, same thing, right? I, when I get a call, do they need a haircut? <laughs> or are they, are they just hitting me up because they, they haven't talked to me? They want to catch up. Like, so I, I kind of get it. In no way, in shape, form, am I going to compare what you do with me. But what I've noticed is a lot of similarities because... Very similar. You're service. We're both service. Exactly. We're service, right? So I, I, I don't gotten confessions in my, yeah. in my chair, bro. People telling me how they cheated on their mm -hmm. wife or how they're this and doing that. And, or how they caught a case. Like the shit that I've heard in my 20 years mm -hmm. of doing here... It also makes you think, like, damn, bro, like you're not okay. Right. Like you're you need help, my dude. Yeah. And and I try to help. Yeah, I don't get paid for the help, but I you, one thing I've learned. You are a therapist, bro. Uh, Barbara's yeah, a therapist. therapist. Yeah, we really bro. are. Especially for the hood, because we don't believe in therapy, right? No. We don't mm -hmm. our therapy is literally our barber. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where a lot of people just kind of let it out. It's it's kind of crazy. It is crazy. How do you balance that? I don't I don't get too deep into it. Okay. Um one way, I don't so you know, I get a lot of people that do a lot of things for money. Um, I don't get involved in any of that. I stay in neutral grounds. And what I also do, I, I have my own personal attorney client privilege mm. type of thing where if I, 20 years, bro, I've heard it all. You name it, right? Um, what I've noticed is that things start, it's a pattern that when it comes, especially when it comes to like marriages and relationships, when it comes to women, it's a pattern. So when I get somebody that's going through something for the first time, I'll shuffle back to like a memory and be like, well, three of my guys went through the mm -hmm. same thing. 
how did that play out? And then I'll, I'll, I'll without naming names, I'm like, look, dude, this is what you got to do. And, and I, and I just use other experiences to fix those experiences, but I never get too deep. I never sit there and, and outside of the haircut call you and I'm like, so how's everything going? <laughs> did you fix that with your wife? <laughs> nah. We're, when it le- it's like, it's like a, a, a professional therapist. As soon as that clock runs out, that's, that's it. all right, we'll see you next week. And he ain't thinking about that shit or she ain't <laughs> thinking about that. But if you got to share one, cause I, bro, this, this is crazy. Cause I know Ruben got some questions, but I, I'm trying to get everything. <laughs> cause there's probably a lot of things that people don't understand. Mm-hmm. Um, if you got to share, you say you did criminal law. I did criminal when I first started. I did that for I for years. So I thought I was going to do that forever. I, I really thought, and I wanted to be like the next era of Johnny Cochran. Like that was my <laughs> dream. Johnny Cochran was like my man. I do seven. Um, and then you know, after a while, um, I think when I had my first daughter, the problem with criminal courts, you have to be in court all the time. And and I was just kind of stressed out. I was always at work, and and I made a promise when I became a lawyer that I would never be that dad, meaning the dad that's working six days a week, 12-hour days. I don't give a fuck if you're eating shrimp and lobster. If you're not there for your kids, you know, that means nothing. And, again, we grew up with immigrant parents, and, you know, they had it rough. So we didn't have that kind of, you know, that lovey-dovey, you know, just let's be real. I mean, immigrants are always in survival mode, so I don't blame them. But I, I always said I wanted to do that. So I did that for about five years, hardcore. I mean, I did murders. I did attempted murders. I oh, did, my God. Uh, I mean, you name it. The only thing I didn't do was any rape or child molestation. And people always ask me about that. And I said the only reason I didn't take is because I knew I couldn't give them a 100% defense. And if I can't give you my 100, I won't take your money and I won't take yeah, your case. Yeah, how do you Everyone, defend? Yeah. Because you guys understand, you know, when you're a lawyer, once you take a case, you got it, in my opinion, a great lawyer – you, you got to put your blockers on and you're either defending them to the death or you're not. So if you can't defend someone to the death, you don't take their fucking case. I don't care how much money they throw at you. You got to have a certain level of, of pride and dignity that knowing if they're going to pay me or I'm even pro bono, your livelihoods in my hands, I better give you my 100%. Mm-hmm. So I knew with, with child cases, I couldn't give you my 100%. I just knew that. And it's not a judgment on you. I just knew I wouldn't give you my 100 So, But outside of that, bro, I did it anything. I mean, you name it, check fraud. I mean, DYs, yeah. attempted murder, murder. I did a triple, a double homicide. Um, you name it, I did it. Because when you're in criminal defense, man, you kind of can't really have a moral high horse, man. Oh, <laughs> this is what you do. and and But you got to believe in, in, in this in kind of... The Constitution, right? We have rights. Whether you're guilty or not, if, if after ex- going through all your rights and they find you guilty, hey, bro, you know, there's nothing I can do. But we got to make sure that we fight for your rights and people got to understand we are your last chance before the government takes something from you that can't be bought, which is your freedom. Mm. So you have to take pride in the fact that we fight the government every day to make sure that your rights are expressed and they're just not doing things out of the blue so you know when you do these cases those are the things that help you kind of get through it and 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 do it but you make that decision once you become an attorney you know i always tell people i'm a mercenary right and what i mean by that is i'm arnold schwarzenegger and terminator i have one job that's my client Mm -hmm. my client's interest is my one and only job i don't care about anything else anything within legal means i have to do to protect my client's interest that's what I do. I don't care who I piss off. I don't care who gets mad. I don't care what people say. I'm a mercenary. My job is my client. And I, I take pride in that. A lot of people don't like that. Even lawyers, hey, when I say that, it's, um, I don't care. That's my job. I'm a mercenary. Yeah, you're, you got a fucking Terminator, bro. That's it. It's, and that's what we're here for. So, you know, the old adage, everyone hates a lawyer until they need one. Um, you know, it took yeah. me a couple years to get over that. Now I just laugh at it. But it took me a while to get over that because people hate lawyers, bro. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I get it. Um, there's lawyers give people reason sometimes, but I think a lot of his misconceptions. But um, we're a pretty hated industry. We're up there with like politicians and used car salesmen. Mm, mm-hmm. you, now, well, what's up? Uh, now, Ruby, I'm gonna let, I know you probably got some things, but let me ask one last thing. Oh, do you think, dog? Um, so if everyone hates lawyers until they need one, facts. What are some things that you could say that, hey, it's fun being a lawyer because of this, or your pros on that? Yeah, um, I've gained friendships from people who started off as my clients and became friends. I've been to weddings. Um, Unfortunately, I've been to funerals as well. 
Um, so I think that was the most un unexpected thing where I've had people I just represented, we just clicked. And I put my all with people and I really kind of get into it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one thing. Two is I've had clients, literally have one client started off as just a clerk at a little store and he saved his money. I helped him open his first business. Dude's got like 10 businesses now. Wow. And to see that and to see that hustle and to be there from literally as a store clerk making, I think he was like $300 a week mm. cash. Mm. And he just saved it, saved it. And then he, I'll never forget the first call. He's like, Mom, I'm ready to open up my first store. I said, bet, let's let's do this. Wow. And now, I mean, you know, he's doing very well. Um, he still refers me clients. And to see him have, you know, this many business. And he came from overseas, no money, dirt poor. You know, he's he's riding clean now. You know, he looks good. He's got a rolly on his wrist. Wow. His wrist. You know, when you see that, it's that's dope, right? Yeah, like, the rolly. That's the American dream, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, and I always tell people that. The American dream is alive. You guys are just some lazy motherfuckers. That's all that is. There's opportunity here, homie. I don't care. Yes, it's tough. It's hard. Nobody ever said the American dream was easy. But look at our communities. I mean, we've come with nothing and we've Literally. flourished. So if you don't make it here, you're just a lazy son of a bitch. That's my yeah, Or you're, you're entitled. Motherfucker. Yes, or you're entitled. Silver spoon, motherfucker. Yep. Yeah. Ruben, what you got from? Because I could just keep bashing. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, keep going. Nah, man. So, bro, uh, first and foremost, man. Uh, this, is first, this is our first time meeting. Um, I hit up Carl uh, Los earlier. Uh, I was like, hey, man, so what's the word today? He's like, I got a lawyer on me. I was like, <laughs> this is dope. This is cool. This is different. You know what I'm saying? Um, first season, obviously, everybody was a barber, cosmetologist. I had my, my homie Mario Hop on. He's a rapper. Um, and this season, we've had comedians a part of it and yes. hairstyles. And now we got a lawyer, man. So this is this is dope. And, uh, I w you know, with lawyers, obviously, you know, you guys have a code, you know what I'm saying? So um, I will say, I will ask though, because if you're in Chicago, right? Correct. So you don't got to say names or anything, but how uh, how often have you had to represent rappers? Um, I, I I did a couple. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, to be honest with you, because how do I say it? <laughs> For them, being locked up is like an enhancement to their career. Yeah. It's weird, right? Uh, and okay. so it, it's it's weird to deal with that dynamic. Two, they want to document everything. And when yeah. you're doing criminal defense, like, you know, I used to tell them, man, shut your social media. And they used to look at me like, what you mean so sh shut my social media off for this? I'm like, well, then just don't talk about your case. Well, why not? Well, because they can use that against you. Like, now you're working against me, you know, because oh, I need man. to have some control over this. <laughs> Um, so I don't do criminal defense anymore, but when I did, I, I did a couple, um, wasn't a fan of it, man. They, they take too much pride in that. And I'm going to say it live. Most of these rappers are full of shit. Mm. Um, you know, they want to live their street life, but they're really not about it. And then, you know, they'll act tough. And then it's like, you go see them in a county. Like, man, you can begging, tell. Begging. <laughs> yeah. Hey bro, what's up, bro, man? Yeah. Can you push up the trial date? Like. <laughs> I thought you was hard, you know, right. like now you're in county and, and you see it. Um, so, yeah, it was it was just a little too much pretentious. And it's like jail's not cool, bro. You know, yeah, no. anybody has been through jails. It's just not cool. Like I've been through county. It just stinks. Like go through county, bro. County's not fun. I mean, it's just not. So it's just when you see how they are with you, how spooked they are, and then they go on Instagram and yeah. they're hard body now. It's like, come on, man. So how in those cases, how often did you have a headache due to them having a song with lyrics explaining that case that you represented? <laughs> That's a good question. So I never had that issue. Um, mm -hmm. None of my guys were ever that big. Um, and I know you're speaking to the YSL thing going yeah. on right oh, yeah, now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we grew up in the 90s, people got to know, hip-hop police have been around forever, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They were following Big and Pac for This is NWA, bro. Correct. Exactly. So this whole idea of hip-hop police is not new. That's one. Two, it is becoming a legal battle now, and, and lawyers are saying the same way you look at a WWF or WWE where they act a certain way, but we all know it's an act, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they portray it as not an act. Well, rap music's the same thing, mm -hmm. right? As we know, most of these dudes are not really hard. I mean, mm -hmm. some of them are, but most of them are just telling stories that they saw. Mm -hmm. So the courts now are having this issue of deciding, well, how much emphasis can we put on? Is it just storytelling? But then in some of these guys' cases, you're naming actually du dudes who actually got mm -hmm. killed. 
That's facts. It's stupid, right? And and I always tell these guys, if you're really that hard, the streets are gonna know you're that hard, bro. You don't need to go on on on, on uh, the song, and and say these things. Right. But um, well, let me ask you. Let me get you off real quick on that. So with that being said, how do you feel about Drake and XX Extension? Like him, you, you see, this is a cool thing about you, bro. You're Rip X. You're young enough, and you're in the in the in the industry like you understand hip hop you listen Correct. to rap like this don't let this outfit fool you many yeah. many he's <laughs> one of us but you also you represent the other side now you're aware of Drake's lyrics where he kind of talks about how if he did how he murdered in a sense like it's subliminal as hell but anybody that's following it you it, you, you know, know what I'm talking about for. Drake said I didn't know that Drake Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Drake got so, Drake from Canada Drake Yeah, yeah. so yeah. right now they're trying they're trying to get him to go to court to, oh, yeah. now I know because I did it, read about that. Yeah, in his lyrics, and I'll show you the song uh, later. I did read about that, and they want to subpoena him to come to court. Because yeah. in his lyrics, if you read between the lines, he's basically saying what he did. Even Correct. though he went to, I think he was in Turkey, uh, where he went, uh, he flew out somewhere, uh, Turkey, what's that spot called? Turks and Caicos? Yeah, he went yes. there, and he said in his rap, he's like, oh, I flew out there while they killed you and all uh. that. And everyone is hearing it is like, yo, this guy's literally just confessing mm. to this guy's murder, and and it went through court and they finally pulled it out. So I don't know if you were aware of that. I did read about that. You know, maybe I'm just confident. I can, in my opinion, that's not enough. Drake is not known to be a. Um, my argument would be one, you got to know who Drake is, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, he's not known to be a killer rapper, right? He's not. Um, you know, he's not like Dirk and these guys. He's not mm -hmm. those guys who are official that you guys know were in the streets. That's one. Two, again, it goes to the original point. How much of this is storytelling? Like a Scarface movie, um, Goodfellas, all of that. Mm -hmm. What separates those from music? And That's true. There's only one thing that separates them: skin color. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be real here. Why can Martin Scorsese get a fucking Academy Award? For his, but these guys are getting indictments. Yeah. And I'm not trying to pull the race card here, but I, I'll say this on camera. Our race, our justice system is not blind, guys. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen people with the same charges, with lighter skin tone, get lesser um, um, charges than my clients. Mm. I've seen it firsthand. I've been, I've myself as the lawyer have walked into court and been told, wait for your attorney to check you in. What? In a suit in and a tie. Nah. Twice that's happened to me. And the third time it happened at the state's attorney's Judges office. or like? No, the bailiffs did it twice. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, it, I, I went off. Yeah, but do you love it when you get to say, I am the lawyer? Well, I was more ignorant than that. I said, <laughs> yeah. I said, bro, I got five hundred dollars shoes on a thousand dollar briefcase. Who the fuck you think you're talking to? Yes, like, sir. What Ooh. criminal comes in here yes, in a thousand dollar briefcase? Like, you know, in, I didn't even know they had thousand dollar briefcase. Uh, <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, I got a Burberry briefcase. But, you know, <laughs> my point: I, I was extra ignorant, arrogant to show them, like, bro, who are you to question question me? But the third one pissed me off the most because I went to the state's attorney's office and I went to file something. And the clerk there was like, oh, your attorney has to file this. Why did it piss me off? She was Puerto Rican. Oh. I said, damn, you going to do that to me? I can see these other people doing it, but damn. Were you wearing regular clothes there? Um, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I might have been dressed like this, maybe. I mean, I wasn't in, like, sweats or anything. Right. But, like, I was. I had my briefcase. Right. Like, I, I, you know, and... No defendant is going to walk into the state's attorney's office to file a motion, bro. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> and that really upset me because she was Puerto Rican. And I said, damn, I mean, even you were doing this. And, and I get I was younger and all that. But if they're doing that to the lawyer that looks like me, what do you think they're doing to my client that looks like me? Ugh. So, you know, I, I do think there is, there is something to that. I also think a lot of judges and prosecutors are older white people. They don't understand the musical culture. Mm. Um, that's part of it. So, but the other part is some rappers are killers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. True. So how do you differentiate between who is just talking WWF, you know, uh, movie style lyrics and who's really living that life? Living that life. And I think the courts right now are having a hard time um, doing it. But the whole YSL thing... Their inner workings are going to what's bring them down. It's not going to be the rap lyrics. Mm. It's going to be the snitching. It's going to be the telling on each other. They all cave. 
that's what's going to bring them in. I don't think the rap lyrics are going to bring them down. Um, I know it's a long-winded answer to answer your question. Oh, yeah, no, bro. Hey, we appreciate it. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's very tricky, and I'm curious to see how the courts interpret this. In my opinion, this should hit the Supreme Court. Damn. Yeah, no, because, bro, that's that's um, that's heavy. That's not even, you know, the fact that that they had, you know, Gunna and the, they they folded like almost mm-hmm. immediately. Um, dude On was d- dude was out rapping yeah. within the week, and the, the I don't know. You saw it, it's it's sad seeing like you know you saw Young Thug's face. You know, you see most him. cases lose because of. People telling on themselves or other people snitching on them. I'd say 80% of them come from one of those two things. People snitch on themselves more than they even know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you guys watch First 48. Uh-huh. You see yeah. how they get them. You're like, ah, oh, they're going to crack them. They're going to crack them. <laughs> and they crack them. And, and, and I ask clients sometimes, and you'll get interesting responses. Um, and I ask them, like, bro, why don't you just shut up? Like, I've taught yeah. you a hundred times. And I had one client who I know was a killer. And he looked me dead in the face. He said, Mo, guilty conscience. Mm. Sometimes your guilty conscience catches up to you. You do this enough times, um, it does catch up to you. Like, why a lawyer, right? Like Ruben was saying, we got a lawyer. We got all types of people. I, this podcast is just, I just want to have different points of views from different perspectives, from different people and different careers. It, I really want to separate in the cut podcast from what I do as a barber and, and, and all that. I really want to just... I wanted this to have his own identity. One of the reasons why I thought it was a good idea, well, one, Minnie came over here and he came with like seven suits, a whole <laughs> wardrobe, a videographer, <laughs> and he worked at headquarters <laughs> to film how many TikToks and, and, and content in general? Uh, we did 25 today. 25 nice. videos. Yeah, they might have been 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. But at the yeah. end of the day, this man came in within four hours and filmed his whole month of content. Now, if you don't know... Follow his um, his TikTok. What is it again? Uh, Mo the lawyer. Mo the lawyer. M O E. I'm always running M O E lawyer. I'm I'm gonna put it right here. I'm always running into his stuff, and this guy just gives tips all day. So if you always want to get like these tips that you're hearing now, he he just breaks down all these categories and all these scenarios. And one of the things that he, you talk about is like, yo, shut up and get a lawyer, mm-hmm. because you say eighty percent of the people snitch on themselves. They do, uh, you know, because. You know, when, when you're in the streets, you, everyone thinks they're a hustler, right? Yeah. And I can talk my way out of this. And, and what I, I tell people about that is, look, if they got you in the station, they either got something on you or you, nothing you say there can help you. Absolutely nothing. They are not your friends, okay? They have a job and their job is to lock you up. So when we just did a video today, they only have 48 hours to hold you. They uh, either after 48 hours. Is that why that show is 48 hours? Yes. Oh, I don't know. I thought so, it was like after 48 yeah. hours. They have 48 <laughs> hours to hold you, and they either have to charge you or release you. By law. If they hold you for 48 hours in one second, that's a major problem. So I always tell people, there's nothing you can say that, that will help you. And they just start thinking they can out-talk the police no one, they're th- already three steps ahead of you, bro. They have probably got some surveillance. They probably got your homie eating some McDonald's in the next room. <laughs> you know, something going on. Just shut up because from the lawyer's perspective, the less that you say, the less that we have to fight against. Mm. And a, a, a good lawyer knows, you know, what evidence you have will help your case. A great lawyer knows what evidence you can keep out will help your case even mm. better. So the trick is what can we keep out of this case so that the jury or the judge don't hear it to make my case stronger. Mm. So if they don't have no proof, they don't have a, a you know murder weapon, they don't have then if you start talking, you just gave them evidence when they had no evidence. So the rule of thumb is if they take you into the station, nothing. And I mean nothing. I've never in my career seen someone talk their way out of that. There's nothing you can say that can help you. Literally mm. just shut the fuck up. And you'll be surprised how many people have a hard time just shutting up. It's yeah. bl- it's, that is the most mind-boggling thing I've learned in my career, how much people cannot just shut up. That's the first thing that when I got my concealer carry, our USCCA representative, he said, when you have a situation and you have to use a gun, when that happens, you call the ambulance, you call for two of them. Call for one for, <laughs> for, for yourself and then one for the, the, the victim. And after <laughs> that, you just shut the fuck up and let the lawyers do the talking. Why do you, why do you call for two? One for yourself. They, they got to check you out, too. Yeah. Uh, so, really? so one will immediately help the whoever's harmed. 
and then you they have to just check make sure you you know you didn't, you didn't get stabbed whatever shit, shit, shit. they'll clear you out and then, wow. but after that yeah just, they they literally said shut the fuck up say nothing literally give them your name outside of that i tell them don't even give them nothing else just ask for a lawyer if you can't afford a lawyer just shut up for two days literally just shut up um because if they have enough they're going to charge you so if you're there for 24 25 hours that means they probably don't have much or they're waiting for something or, you know, GSR results, whatever it is. Just trust me. Just just. And what are GSR results? Um, it's gunshot residue. Gun residue? I yeah. figured. Okay. Uh, dude, that's, that's crazy, man. I mean, thank God I've never been under the, the, the lights and the stress. But I hear it gets really intense in there. No windows, small room. It's cold. They usually turn up the AC in there, I hear. Yeah, it depends on where you're at. Um, I will say this. Chicago police have never given me issue. It's the suburbs that give us problems. You think it's because you're racial? <laughs> um, I think that's part of it. I think they're just dorks um, yep. that just kind of have that ego trip. I, I, I'll give you one story. I was in Chicago. The only time I ever had a small issue, just to show you how much they they respect attorneys. And, and this is, you know, and I mean this in a good way about Chicago police. But this one dude, he was just kind of jerking me around a little bit, kept making me wait, kept making me wait, which never happens in Chicago. And a white shirt walked past me once, and then he walked past twice. And then the third time, he comes, he's like, counselor, have you been taken care of? I said, yeah, man, I told dude like 20 minutes ago, I'm waiting to go you know, see my guy. He's like, all right, I'll get you ready in a minute. And I saw him go in the back, and he's like ripping the dude. Get this lawyer to see his client right now. Wow. Stop what you're doing. He should not be waiting. Wow. The white shirt put his ass in check and said he has a job to do. He should have saw his client a long time ago. Get him in the room with your client. I said, thanks, Sergeant. You know, I appreciate that. That was the only time CPD I've ever had issue. Every other time you walk in, they're respectful. They know we got to see our client. Suburbs, though, Oak Lawn. I'll call out Oak Lawn. <laughs> I don't give a shit. They're the only, one of the only police departments that searched me, the lawyer. What? Chicago police have never searched me. Um, them and the feds. Feds searched me once, too, when I went to the feds. Uh, the feds are discreet, man. They got offices in place. There's one right by Orland Mall. Stop. I t went to turn in a client. <laughs> that mother gave me the address. I said, hold on, man. This address looks familiar. I put it in my phone. That shit's on 94th Avenue. Is right that is mall. that one of those little you know, those brown big, buildings? Yeah. No, Damn. One of those. I had my tax attorney. I mean, I had my tax person there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one of those? One of those buildings. The feds had a, a whole spot on the third floor, so you got to go in. So I mean, They were cool, but... A uh, feds office. Is that just where they do like paperwork or is that where they're like surveilling and shit? Who knows, right? Yeah. So when you, it's crazy. It's like an office building. But when you get to their floor and you come out the elevator, you got to knock on the door and then you go in there. It's a small room and then you got to go through the metal detector and then they come out. They were nice. They're like, you know, they, but they come out suit and tie guys with the guns. There's no, you know. No FBI and, jacket. Um, yeah, no, none of that. These were suit and tie guys. And he was nice. He's like, look, counsel, no offense, but, you know, we have to pet you down. So do what you got to do. I'm, I'm not tripping. Uh, but I will say this, a, a funny thing is, I, clients, when when they get charged is one thing, but if you tell them the feds are after you, I've had dudes break down and cry in my office. When you tell them the feds when are after you? When you tell them this situation, um, they thought it was a state case, and then um, he was in my office. He said, man, I think the feds were knocking on my mom's door. I said, man, let me call him. I called the feds. I played stupid. I said, yeah, you know, I, I, he's somewhere. I don't know where he's at. They're like, oh, we know he's in Chicago. Take your time. We, we get paid by the hour, counsel. Wow. Take your time. Basically, we know where he's at. We'll get him eventually. So, all right, cool. I went back, and I sat down. He's like, um, so what they say? I said, yeah, feds looking for you. <laughs> Damn. And he just looked. <laughs> And just, poof, just what started. was the charge? Can you say? Um, it was some. Um, this was when the the scammers were heavy. The check frauds, oh, the credit card scammers. Ooh, nice. Yeah, this is when scamming was like really bubbling up. So again, he's a scammer. He's not a hard dude, right? He's just a smart scammer. He wasn't like a street guy. I've never had someone cry so much in my office. I didn't know what the fuck to do. I'm grown just, dude, grown ass man. <laughs> You're like, with I his be? boys there too. Like they're all. And I'm just, I'm looking, I'm looking at this boy, like, what do I do? Like, I, I said, man, I'm going to give you a few minutes. <laughs> I'm going to give you a few minutes, collect yourself. Let me get hey, you some water. Let me, let me lock out, out of my computer first. <laughs> let, me, let me do you know, all that shit. Um, but anytime, and I'll, I'll have guys come in, you know, they, they, did the feds pick it up? I'm like, nah, I'm like, all right, cool. Like, so what would be, okay, excuse my ignorance, but I, I'm sure there's people going to be watching this wondering the same thing. Why is it so much harder when the feds are looking for you compared to the state? You know, I don't know why they get so scared. I think they know. Look, bro, feds have a 98% conviction rate. 
Okay, so that means if the Ooh, feds are coming after they you, got you, they got you, right? State, you're at about a 60% conviction rate. So if the feds are coming after you, that means they probably spent a year or two chasing you down. They got every surveillance in the book. They got the federal government's budget, which means they don't have a budget. They can spend whatever they want. Wow. The charges are going to be more. You usually got to do 85% of your time. Um, they just know if the federalities are coming, you're toast. It's have it, you ever beat a fed, a fed case? No. Oof. Do you, you don't beat fed cases. Do you know your... <coughs> so, speaking of, like, wins and losses, do you have a... Uh, do you, have, do you guys keep a record? Yeah, of course they had a keep I was going to say, but like, do you guys have a tally? Like, okay, I'm 32 and 3. Like. <laughs> uh, I will tell you this. So I don't keep a direct tally, but one of the greatest lawyers I've ever worked with, he's, he's one of the greatest attorneys in Chicago ever, and he said, it was when I was younger, and I lost a case, and I was just really upset. And he said, Mo, if you're going to do this, learn to lose. If you're batting at least 500, you're an all-time great in our mm. industry. Um, so any lawyer that ever says, and I know you guys have seen this commercial, we've won a hundred percent of our cases, bullshit you have, you either haven't tried any or you're only cherry picking the really easy ones. Yeah. No great lawyer will ever tell you they've won every case. Any lawyer that says that you are full of shit. We laugh at lawyers like that mm. because that means we haven't seen you in court. You haven't tried. So the, one of the greatest lawyers I've ever met said, Mo, if you're batting 500 as a defense attorney, you're killing the game. Mm. Learn to lose because you're only as good as the facts of your case. That's facts. You know. Now, do, so. you, do you have to disconnect yourself emotionally to just kind of move on when you lose? Yes, but it's hard. Oh, yeah, because you give your all. How do you... If Because I care, right? And I'm not saying... A, a lot of lawyers do. Some lawyers don't. Some lawyers will tell me, I want to check cashes. I did my job. I move on. I'd love to be able to do that. But to, I'd lie to you if I tell you I didn't lose sleep over a case. Um, mm. I've had clients get 35 years on my time, you know, oh uh, on a plea deal, right? Oh. But they were facing life. So the other thing is, what is a win, right? Yeah. So if you were facing 20 and I got you three and you'll be on a year and a half, motherfucker, that's a win. That's that's a win. win. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it def yeah. depends how you define gotcha. win. So if you're talking straight not guilties, yeah, bro. If you're batting 500 on not guilties, you're an all-time legend. But... Again, wins can vary for different people. Um, I know guys that have been in and out of jail. Bro, you get them a year, they're, they're cool. They're cooling for that six months. They're going to lay low. They, they got their commissary straight. To them, that's a win. Yeah. But to a dude that's never been in jail, to tell him you got to sit down for a year, oh, oh bro, like it's, it, that's the tough conversation. But the, the, the street guys that have been through it, they're easier to deal with. They know the system as well as we do. Oh, that's crazy. If not yeah. better. <laughs> so, this, I mean, this is why, like, I stay away from anything that can get me in trouble my whole life. I mean, you know me forever, mm -hmm. right? I always try to go straight away because I'm not gonna, I'm not the type. I'm not saying by no means. I'm a very tough-minded individual, mm -hmm. and I know that because at 18, before I started working at the shop, I recruited my, I like put myself in boot camp where 90% of the people there were there from court order or because of their parents forced them there. I just went there because I knew I wasn't gonna get a diploma on time, and I was like, you know what? If I go to a boot camp in six months, I'll get a GED. I went there, did all that. Started off with 3,000 candidates, graduated 340 some people at the wow. end of six months. That's how many, that was like the, the graduation rate was like fucking less than 10% mm -hmm. or a little over. And a lot of people quit. It wasn't because of physically. There was a lot of dudes that were taller, yeah. stronger, in mental. shape. It's the mental. If you're a mental dude, and I know, I'm not saying that if I get locked up, I'm going to be good. No, but I know I'm a strong minded right. individual. But I still, because of that, I refuse to go sell drugs or mm -hmm. scam people or go the easy route because I can't face the crime. I refuse to. Right. But then again, there's times where, hey, you fall asleep behind the wheel or, hey, yeah. you had too much to drink. You're not intentionally Correct. trying to get yourself in You're trouble. You're not a criminal. You just did yeah. a bad act. Something bad happens. And I know a lot of good people, man. Being at the shop at Official Clutch for 14 years, I met a few people that either died on car accidents mm. or people that just fell asleep behind the wheel mm -hmm. after drinking and killed people. Now they're in jail for 20, 30 years. That that feeling, right? I could only imagine. I've had a client who I knew very well personally. He killed his best friend because he, you know, they were drinking. They went out. They got in a bad accident. His friend threw the flew through the windshield, killed his best friend. Mm. And one of the things that I told the judge in the back was, Judge, no matter what sentence you hand down, he's got a life sentence. This man this just shit. killed his best, and I'm talking best, like his homie. We talked every day. They talked and. And he looked at me, he's like, Mo, I already got a life sentence. So you want me to do two years in jail, 
I'm cool with it. Like, you know, those are the tough situations where he's a regular dude. Not only has he got to go to jail now, not only did he lose his career, he's got to. And guess who broke the news that his friend died? That was me. You did? I had to. Because his charges got upgraded. How did he not know? He was locked up. Oh. He didn't know, and I was the only one to have access to him as his attorney to go mm. sit down with him. Now, keep in mind, I know both dudes. Oh. So I had to go sit in there, and you know, I'm trying to talk to him about his case, and the first thing he asked is, how's dude? And I was prepping the whole ride there. How do I say it? How do I? And oh you still God. can't prep. And, and I just looked at him, and I just shook my head. I said, hey, bro, you know, he didn't make it. And I had, literally, I, I just, I didn't talk for like, t- I just let him just, you know, he just bawled crying. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I just sat there for like 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, that's the things you learn. And, and when I mentor law students now, and I do a lot of talks, and I always tell them, you know, don't get too much, do, don't get caught up in this allure of being an attorney, because at the end of the day, you still represent everyday regular people. Yeah. Don't lose that essence. You can't lose that essence of being a regular person, because... We do get jaded, right? We see so much shit, you know, that sometimes you do get jaded. And I always preach to them, you're still dealing with a human emotion. You can never, the moment you lose that, you're not going to be a good attorney. Does it make your job harder? Sure, but it makes you a better attorney. I mean, you got to know, we represent people, bro. We don't represent robots. Mm. And everyone reacts to things differently. So I've just learned over time, you know, um, sometimes you push, sometimes you pull back. You got to know your client. Not, that's that's facts. So you, you you what do you what do you practice now? So we only do basically injury law now. Um, is that better? Does that make you feel more like? Yeah, because I get to fight State Farm, who made forty four billion dollars in premiums last year, yes. right? I don't lose no <laughs> sleep over that. <laughs> fuck State, fuck Farm. State Farm, and I got State Farm, right? <laughs> My best friend owns a State Farm. And I tell him, fuck you every day, right? Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> You're they're the biggest, bro. They're the biggest insurance is the biggest scam pulled on this country. They're the biggest scumbags. They do the dirtiest shit. Um, and what I try to tell people is they think, oh, your clients are scammers. Bro, this is in the law. You think State Farm's going to pay us something that they're not required to? Mm, they're no. not in the business of just handing out checks. So, you know, when we talk about pain and suffering and we talk about future specials and all that, that's in the law. That's not just State Farm being nice to you, okay? So mm. we are just exercising our clients' right. And, bro, I cannot tell you how many times they've tried to screw people over. Then they hire us. We get on the phone. Their tone changes. It just happened to me this week. Literally, this week. They're insured, ran a stop sign, hit our guy. This is before he called us. And they denied liability because they said it's a he said, she said. So I'm like, I'm looking at the report, stop sign. So I called. I said, hey, lady, I'm confused. You know (laughs) Why are you, what is the he said, she said? Well, your client was kind of in the middle of the street. I said, look, I don't care if my client was doing fucking jumping jacks in the middle of the street. Your guy had a stop sign. And I have everything here. Please explain to me again. And she's trying to come up. To, I said, lady, the law says you have to stop at a stop sign. Two days later, they called us. Yeah, we're going to accept liability. Wow. You're goddamn right. You well, You don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. You're not doing me any favors because I would have smacked you over the head with a lawsuit and I would have got more money. So they, they contacted legal and legal said, yeah, take liability. Just to sh- So if this guy didn't call us, he's fucked. Yeah, he would have been fucked. Did he get injured? Bad? I mean, he's injured pretty bad. His car smashed. So they yeah. weren't going to cover that. His Damn. rates would have went up. He's got a, you know, a $10,000 hospital bill. You know, I mean, I can go on and on about how they try to screw people over. So, again, I'm I'm comfortable in what I do. And I know, you know, I've been called ambulance chains. So I've called all types of names. And it doesn't bother me. I laugh at it. I always tell them if it's a good joke, I love it. But um, <laughs> because I know and I always tell them, you don't see what I see. That's true. You guys might see your friend who scammed them. But I know the lady who's 60 years old who now can't walk her grandkids to the park anymore because of this accident, right? I know the kid who lost his dad in an accident and the policy was only $100,000. That's all I can get for this kid, right? Wow. You guys, not speaking you, I'm speaking generally, but when people talk shit about injury attorneys, I tell them, you don't see what we deal with, right? Yes, are, do people pimp the game? Sure. I don't even care about them because State Farm has pimped us for years. Yeah. So why do poor people always go after poor people? And you're defending a company that made $44 billion on auto premiums. I'm not talking about house, 
business. Wow. 44 billion in revenue, just State Farm, just auto. But you're tripping on homie down the street who might have made an extra five grand off of them. Oh, he's a scammer. Come on, bro. Like we uh, poor people fight poor people way too much when it comes to insurance. It just drives me crazy. So, so. as an injury lawyer, is that only auto or are you like? No, we do a lot of dog bites. Um, believe it or not. So what people don't know is dog bites cause a lot of harm. We've had, we've had to get clients plastic surgery. Damn. Um, you know, if you bite into your arm, it'll fuck up your whole muscle right here. And one thing that you you know I've learned over time is the entire human body is connected. Right. Yeah, yeah. So your wrist is affected by what happens at your elbow here because the muscles here are controlling your mm. wrist. So if you screw this up and this, it's going to affect your whole arm, your wrist and now your hand. Mm. So now we got to take you to specialist and then we got to get a plastic surgeon to fix it. You know, I've had a girl 26 years old and, you know, some people are self-conscious as is. Now you got a big ass scar right here. That fucks with her mental, yeah. you know, and it, you got to account for that. In my opinion, I always tell the insurance, you need to account for pain and suffering. So dog bites are very uh, known, and we do a lot of medical malpractice. Um, are they all types of dogs, or is there a certain breed? No, you you'll be surprised. There'll be all types yeah. of dogs. And in Illinois, dog bites are strict liability, meaning, and this is good for people that have dogs, um, strict liability means if your dog bit someone, no matter the situation, you're responsible for it. There's only two exceptions to that. One is if you're trespassing. So if you break into my house and my dog bites you, you can't sue me for yeah, that. Of course. Um, or if I didn't have permission to be at your house. Or two, if you agitated the dog in any way. But a lot of p examples we get, and I've seen friendships die over this. Wow. Come to your house, dog's playing with the friend, the dog bites the friend in the face, and then the, the friend sues the friend. That's fucked up. Low key. Like... Like, imagine yeah. if I came over, bro, and, and, and Melo said, I don't oh, like Mexicans. You were never there, man. You were never there. You, you were like, what? Well, let me moving? ask you this, Los. And that's a, that's a good point, right? That's a good conversation because I kind of agree and I kind of don't. What if their, the dog's injury to your friend was so bad that their eyes hanging out their socket? Then. And, and one thing you got to keep in mind, I don't sue you. I sue your insurance company. Right. Would you care for me to sue your insurance company so your friend can get their eye fixed? I wouldn't care. Right. So I always tell people, we don't sue people. Which is why it's great to have guys, if you guys have a business or anything, have, insurance, have insurance for your house, your apartment, have a business insurance. If Everything. somebody slips and falls here, they don't even sue me. Just win the company. I wouldn't be mad. I have a dog, little Mellow, Boston Terrier. Mm -hmm. My guy came in here a couple months ago. And Mellow has this thing where um, when you give him a ball, he loves to like, like, he'll give it to you, and you try to grab it, and he wants to lock onto it so you guys can play. Um, like, you know, he's holding onto it. His 10-year-old kid comes in, and I'm in the bathroom. I forgot what I was doing. And he goes to grab the toy off of him, mm. and Melo trying to get a better grip on the ball. Uh, grab his let's go and grabs it and just, like, cuts his finger off. And then I hear crying and all that. So I get out of the bathroom. They're in the other bathroom, and I'm like, Ricky, what, what happened? He's like, Melo bit the kid. Now, hearing Mellow bit the kid is like hearing something that just doesn't make sense because my dog doesn't bite people. And then I'm like, damn, how bad is it? Is it? And I was like, oh, he's bleeding. You know, Ricky's like, oh, he's bleeding. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so now I'm thinking the word. And this client of mine, very straight, arrow dude. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, right? Is it, is it bad enough? Is it going to sue me? He's ended up being a little nick and all that. Okay. And I felt so bad. Like, I even told him, my dude, don't even worry about the haircut. He's like, dude, you're good. Don't worry about it. But I can tell in his demeanor, he was really upset. Right. Like, like upset, like, I'm going to put this dog down upset. Mm. Just very, and, and I try to talk to him, and I'm like, dude, you've been, for years, my dog's never, you know, but it's just such a tough situation because it's like, do I defend my dog or do I defend my client who's <laughs> paying me? It was, it was hard and for not me. Just that, but I also tell people, you know, um, you need to respect <laughs> the dog as well. And what I mean by that is, mm -hmm. did you asked to play with the dog did you get permission mm -hmm. i you know i've taught my kids and, and we love dogs but we'll be walking they want to go to i said no bobby you got to ask them first right ask the owner first can you play with the dog you know and 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 ask because you don't know the dog might not react to strangers probably or kids, right? yeah or kids yeah. so I, there is you know, some type of responsibility on you, but the law says you are strictly liable for that unless you meet those two exceptions. If you don't, it does not matter. You are liable. So if somebody breaks into this place and I don't have beware dog signs and they no. get bit, I'm still good? You're still good. Those whole be you got to have a uh, sign, even waivers. People are like, oh, well, I signed a waiver. Fuck that waiver. <laughs> because 
Waivers do not negate negligence. We sue for negligence. So I don't care if you signed a waiver. If you were still negligent, that overcomes any waiver that you sign. And we get a lot of people that, oh, oh, I signed a waiver. I was scared to sue. I thought I couldn't. No, they told you you couldn't because they don't want you to. Mm, now, but, does that only include for dogs? Or no, for in general. What? Like, wait, just because, you know, I always tell people this. So if I get you to <laughs> sign this and say, oh, yeah, you can hit me over the head with a baseball bat, that's still negligent. Just because you signed on it doesn't mean I wasn't negligent in smacking you over the head with a baseball what? bat. So what's the point of signing all these damn... NDAs. Is a- oh, no, no, not NDAs. What's the point of, like, when you go um, skydiving and you mm-hmm. sign a waiver, How is that still negligent? Yes and no. So it depends on what happens, right? So, for example, let's use the skydiving uh, as an example. You could sign a waiver and they say, well, if this happens or this happens or this happens. But let's say the employee came drunk, hit the wrong button, that's negligent. Oh, I can oh. still sue you for that. I don't care what your waiver says. You weren't supposed to come to words true, drunk. That's true. You're negligent, right? Mm. Or grossly. Sometimes if there's a waiver, you got to have gross negligence, right? So it just depends on it. But I always tell people the waivers are just, are, they're not ironclad. And they just make people think that so that they don't do anything about it. But no waiver in the world can, can get over the fact that you can't act negligent or be grossly negligent. And, and to bring it into barbers, you know, yes, barbers can be sued. Mm. And the standard is, you know, barbers all have a standard of care. If, if they deviate from that standard of care and they cut you up the wrong way because you weren't using the, the razor right or you didn't have training to use a razor yet. Well, they weren't yet. clean. They yeah. weren't clean and you Ooh. infected it. Well, every barber in America knows you got to clean your, your, your shit, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's grossly negligent because you went outside of the scope of a normal barber. Wow. Now you are grossly negligent. Now you can go after them for that. Mm. So, and, and even, and I see, and I, one thing I always loved about you guys, your shops are always clean. Mm-hmm. But I've been to some dusty ass barber shops, okay? <laughs> Same. Bro, Same. dirty ass barber shops. So, slip and falls, you yeah. know? If, if you're a barber and you never clean up your hair all day, you have the foresight that someone can come and slip on this. I'll sue the shit out of you for that. <laughs> because you're grossly negligent. That's just Thanks. dirty. That's just not taking care of your customers that you leave hair everywhere. Which is why it's crazy because which is why we built a stage. If you notice official cuts mm-hmm. and notice your headquarters, we I, I got that from Yak. Building that stage because that separated us from the rest of the people, from the oh, kids running around. Oh, that's smart. So yeah, even though there's days where we're busy and there's hair everywhere, it's always that rule at the shop, and I'm sure a lot of shops have it. If it's too, if everyone's busy, whoever's mm-hmm. done first has has to like make that round. Mm-hmm. And when you make that round, you don't have to make that round until everybody else makes that oh, round, right? right. And it was just something that you, you just it just comes with. You see it, all right? If you obviously see hair, mm-hmm. but for barber shops that are leveled with the with the people, I can see that happening mm-hmm. because there are times where you're just busy, right. holidays and all that. You're not gonna have time to sweep mm-hmm. after every cut, Correct. even though you should. But let's, let's be real, we're barbers. For the most part. But that you might get away with. What I'm saying is if hair is now by the front door, yeah, just hair is by the bathroom door, that's just negligent, bro. Have you ever have you ever heard or done a case for barber? No, I have not sued a barber. I don't, <laughs> I don't. I have too many barber friends. I've been in the barber industry. I've represented a lot of barbers and, and companies. <laughs> um, I, I, I probably wouldn't. The only way I would is if I felt they were just really grossly negligent to the point that they just didn't give a fuck. Those cases I like because I, I like the punitive damages. And punitive means punishment damages. I want to go after punitives because I want to teach your ass a lesson. Mm, okay, so yeah. a lot of times we file lawsuits. It's not always for the money. It's to change the way an industry operates. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes you might see a lawsuit and be like, man, it's kind of a bullshit lawsuit. Sure, it might be for that one, but we're resetting the law so that all the other bigger companies in that industry are now scared to do that whatever thing that they were doing because now there's case law to back it up and say, we'll smack you over the head and now you're going to have to pay for it. Mm. So a lot of times we file lawsuits just to, you know, teach, I hate to say teach them a lesson, but to to correct what we think are just negligent ways. And for those who don't know, what, what are the proper steps in like being um, given a subpoena or served, as they say, right? Like, how does that work when, when you're being sued? I, I see it in movies all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, people are dressing up like regular people to serve people because that they're does dodging. happen in real life. Oh, I know. 
It but I, I'm trying to like really. I want to since I got you here. I'm trying to understand everything. I'm trying to learn. What are the steps? How does that work when someone's getting sued or served? Which person? The person serving or the person getting served? Which one's which one you think is more important to explain? They're both the same. So, actually, getting served. Look, if they're gonna serve you, if they catch you, they catch you. There's none you could do about it. Okay, we we hire companies. Do well, people have cameras to prove that they served the person? No, so it could be debated. I mean, they have their ways. If they think you're going to do that, they might do that. So we outsource that. So how it works, you first have to go to the court. The, the sheriffs have to try first. Sheriffs are lazy as shit. We know they're not going to do it. Then we go to the court again and tell the judge, let me just get my people to do it. Judge signs off on it. You hire a process server. They're trained depending on the client. If they tried for two months, they know that you're dodging them. Yeah, they're going to start going in your bushes with the, you know, uh, the camo and the army gear. <laughs> and I've seen somewhere they just throw it at you. Oh, You've been wow. served. And you got to go to court and say, have it been served? And then you, what would happen if in that situation, you would bring your process server in and you would make them testify. Mm. And a judge, if you got a, so we use re reputable process service for that because the judges will know this is a reputable company. Um, so they're probably telling the truth. Yeah. What I always tell people is, look, man, don't dodge the service because they're eventually going to get your ass. And if they do, you look guilty as hell dodging them. No, that doesn't matter. Oh, that doesn't matter? The, the court will never know that you dodged them. Mm. Uh, but I always tell people, just get to the point already. Okay? Right. Get to it. There's, there's nothing you can do to stop them from serving you. You can hide, but they're eventually going to get to you. Um, just get to it, bro. Just, okay. Just let them serve you. I, that's what I tell people, but nobody listens to me. <laughs> nobody wants to get served. That's the other thing. People always... My favorite thing is when people call me for advice and then go do the opposite. Oh, they just same. they just know, you know, they just know better. I'm like, right. or when their um, mechanic friend told them better advice than I did. Like, <laughs> I've literally had people say that, hey. bro. I was at my mechanic the other day. He said, he, man, said. he said you should be doing this, bro. He reads at a fifth grade reading level. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't need your mechanic. To, I'm not going to tell the mechanic how to put a transmission on, am I? You know, <laughs> you're not going to go to your your, your uh, lawyer for you know a, a, a cancer, right? <laughs> right? You're going to go to your doctor. So that's that's probably my biggest pet peeve is is Get a second opinion. Just make sure it's, it's, it's an attorney. Certain venues have an assumption of risk. Mm. So, like, if you go to a baseball game, you can't sue them for getting hit with a baseball in your head. That's true. You assume the risk that you're at a baseball game that something like that might happen. Mm. But, again, it does not negate negligence. So, if you're in the stadium and a boulder falls on you or a, a, bro a, you know, a brick falls on you from the building... There's no assumption of risk there because I didn't think I would go to a baseball game and have a brick fall on my head. Ooh, see, I didn't know that shit. Wow. So there's the assumption of risk only goes so far, but always remember, if there's one thing you remember, is negligence is negligence. There's no way around it. So you just can't be negligent in anything you do. Mm. I'm going to definitely uh, follow you on your socials, man. I'd love to have you at a comedy show. Um, come get some laughs with us. I think you need some laughter yeah, here, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, here and there. Yeah, maybe one day I'll sponsor. Our office will sponsor one of your shows. Hey, man, I we'll appreciate that, bro. That. Oh, yeah. I do want to say this before we go, and I got on camera. Uh, I'm a big fan of Los. I, I admire him so much. I, I, I've been looking at him for years. I use you for examples for a lot of people in different oh. industries. Um, I just I think you're a badass creative. You've always pushed the boundaries in, in your industry, which is what I'm trying to do in my industry. Um, so I just, I wanted to publicly shout you out. I do it privately a lot, but you know, cause I've had a f kind of front row seat to see your, your growth and you've just always been ahead of the game, bro. And, and you've pushed boundaries and most people are scared to do that. And seeing where you started, and I always tell people, man, hard work trumps anything. Look at this dude. I mean, he started from fucking nothing and now he's doing world tours and, and all that, and I said, you got to be a bad dude to have the goat as your fucking logo. Ah. So that just shows. But I, I wanted to give you your flowers in person because I feel we don't do that enough to people. We no, always we wait don't. till they die to do this obituary. So I wanted to give you your flowers. Bro, in person. fucking love. Same thing no, about you. Absolutely. And, and no. since we're giving flowers, from what my understanding, you're really no longer in, like I'm not saying you're not active, but you're not. You were telling me last time you were here, you're. You have a law firm and you let people do your stuff now. I don't, yeah, I don't actively practice as much. Um, I, I still oversee. I'm, I'm very big on, you know, being meticulous. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but my philosophy is I'll never be great at everything. So I hire great people who do great things yes. and I pay them a great amount of money mm -hmm. <laughs> to do those great things. Um, and that makes it better for my clients. 
you know, there's certain things in my office that there's other people in my office who are just much better at it right now. Like right now, one of our attorneys for medical malpractice, he's a practicing doctor at an emergency room and he's wow. a lawyer during the day. Wow. That's so when I saw him, I said, come here, you're the best of the best. I want you for my clients yeah. and he gets paid more than anybody. And I don't care because I want the best of the best for my clients. He knows way more than I can ever, you know, ever know. So I look for the best people. I bring them in. I give them the best systems, the best processes. I give them all the perks. And I say, just treat my clients good. Give me the best results. And I'll make sure you're taken care of. So I focus on that more than anything. Else. So my point to that is, is that, dude, you're still young. Mm -hmm. How old are you? 38. 38 years old. And this guy is overseeing things, right? He's not somebody at 38 who's still running courthouse to courthouse and representing people on the daily. This guy build a a solid team and is overlooking. So I, to me, when I see that, I'm like, dude, because there's people that, that, that been law been lawyers for 20 years, still practicing. And they think a lot of them say I'm crazy. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm advancing. I can't build my firm if I'm in court all day. Exactly. And I can't make sure my clients are getting better service. I'm, I can't go look for better doctors. You if know, you're I just can't educate that, the people. Yeah, if I'm if in that rabbit in, hole. In that little hamster wheel. And one lawyer, and, and I'll end on this, but one lawyer told me something. Uh, he's got a $100 million law firm. So I go find the best law firms. I literally knock on their doors or I meet them at conferences and I just take them out and I just pick their brain. Mm. And one thing changed everything for me. He said, Mo, it's not the how, it's the who. And what he meant by that is it's not how to get things done. It's who can I get to get this it's one fast. thing done? Because there's always someone better than you at a certain thing. So never think, how can I do this? Think about who, who can, can do get? this. That changed everything. I started to delegate and we went from decent. Now we're, you know, a seven figure law firm because I went from how to who Ooh. and I brought in some killers and but I set a standard too like if you yeah. ain't a killer you don't you're, you're not allowed in my office like mm. you got to really be for the people and want to kick some ass uh, sometimes I have to calm my litigation paralegal down and say relax we're not going to fight everybody <laughs> but I'm glad that she has the fighter mentality and I tell them you know, my people expect us to fight so if you're ready to fight you could join my team but if That's not facts. I can't bring it it's like they say that rich quote I'm going to end it on this rich people get paid to work wealthy people get paid to think so when I hear that, 100%. it's like, that's what I want to be. It's not that I put in my work, but I feel like I've met a level now where I can, if I, once I get the income right, I'm, I'm going to bring on the team mm -hmm. because my thinking has always been grade A, next level. So uh, that inspired me. For you to do that at 38, I'm going to be 36 this year. I got two and a half years to to get to that level. Hey, y'all make me excited to be 30, dog. I'm, Dude, I'm, tell them. 27. I'm hype, bro. 30s are your best. Yeah, bro. Yeah. I'm hyped to be in my 30s, uh, dog. That you, you hit your prime in your mid-30s. Yeah. yeah. I always thought it was the 20s. Physical uh, prime in your 20s. Mental prime 30s. Uh, financial prime in your 40s. That yeah. should be your goal. Yeah. So you chilling, man. 27, you chilling. <laughs> but work hard. Stay working Oh, hard. no. You know me, dog. Yeah. I'm always... Uh, but, dude, many Mo... Follow him on TikTok. You won't regret it. Follow him on Instagram. Follow him all over. He's always on. He's the one lawyer that I see just always active on social media Every because day. he's taking that platform while his team's handling the other platform. Yeah. So salute to that, bro. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. It's an honor to have you here, bro. Oh, thank you, guys, for having me. And this is going to be fun. Yeah, this is going to be a dope episode, man, for those of you guys. Because a lot of the questions that I asked were questions for me, and I'm sure a lot of you guys had the same questions. So with that, signing out. In the cut. Let's go.